Hey everybody, this is George from DinosaurGeorge.com answering the questions I get from around the world. Uh, this episode, we are going to highlight a Giganotosaurus tooth replica. This is a cast off of a Giganotosaurus. This is cool. It is item 3023 and it retails right now for $15.95, 15.95. Uh, we do ship worldwide. I get a lot of people writing to me asking me, do we ship all over the world? Yes, we ship all over the world. If you have a collection of dinosaur uh, or any fossils um, or replicas, this is a good piece to add to it, especially if you have a Tyrannosaurus Rex tooth. If you've got a T-Rex tooth, tooth, I would get this Giganotosaurus tooth because you can see what a distinct difference between the teeth of T-Rex were and the tooth of Giganotosaurus. Giganotosaurus's tooth is much more blade-like, very much like, uh, like the tooth of Carcharodontosaurus. So it's a much better meat slicing tooth, but uh, it's not nearly as robust. This cast also, you can even feel the serrated edges. So this is a very good piece. So if you want to start a collection, or if you have a collection, a Giganotosaurus tooth would be a good one. All right, let's get into it. Jasper from Balin, Belgium. I hope I pronounced Balin. Uh, it's a, he, Jasper says, it's good that you can finally answer my question. I'm glad that I actually have the chance. Uh, Jasper, I'm glad. I know that you're very busy and don't have a lot of time. Well, I appreciate that, Jasper. I, I am busy sometimes, but I, I need to do a better job of shooting more of these and answering you guys' question. Okay, Jasper says, I've been doing some research about dinosaurs in Belgium, but no carnivores until I read something about a claw of a Megalosaurus uh, lonziensis. It was found in Lonzi. Can you tell me more about the find? Because I hope to get in the field in about two years. Thanks, Mr. Blessing, for your time. Jasper, I appreciate the courtesy calling me Mr., but you are welcome to call me George or TDG or Dinosaur George or whatever you would like. But I do appreciate very much your courtesy and the courtesy of so many of you. Okay, um, I believe that that claw has now been assigned not to Megalosaurus, but to an Ornithomimus, one of the ostrich-like dinosaurs. But uh, it doesn't mean there weren't predators in Belgium. They just, maybe they just haven't been found. But clearly, I, I think you guys are the ones that found the iguanodon tracks that were so incredible uh, in a coal mine or something like that, if memory serves me right. So absolutely, you had predators there. You just may, they just may not have been found, or at least I'm unaware of them. So for right now, I don't believe that claw belongs to Megalosaurus. I think that name is now considered a, a probably a dubious name or a name that shouldn't have been given because I do think that they now recognize that as an ornithomimid claw. All right, Kyle from Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania. Hey, DG, how is your exhibit going? Kyle, it's doing very well. The exhibit is traveling nonstop. Um, we've seen well over 100,000 people with it. It's been really cool and I enjoy it a lot. Uh, I was wondering, do you think any of the feathered dinosaurs, including T-Rex, look like any birds today? Thanks again for your time and hope you answer everyone's questions. Well, thank you, Kyle, and it's nice that you're, you're also hopeful that I can ask, answer other people's questions. That's really cool of you. Um, okay, so did uh, the feathers look anything like feathers from birds today, or did the dinosaurs look like birds today? Um, I think that even though they had very bird-like qualities, the theropods, the predators, I think you could clearly differentiate the difference between a feathered dinosaur and a true bird. So that would be a, um, a non-avian dinosaur and an avian dinosaur. Mostly the thing that would stand out would be the elongated tail. Even though it was feathered, I think that would make it really clear. Now, there are obviously some birds that have longer tail feathers, but their actual tail is no longer per bird than any, anything else. Some have longer feathers. So I think that even though there's a tremendous amount of similarities from a distance, you would be able to tell a very dramatic difference between a feathered dinosaur and a feathered bird. But anyway, it's a good question. All right, Braden from Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Hey, Mr. Blessing, I'm one of your friends from Facebook. Braden, great to hear from you, buddy. Call me George, call me DG, call me what you want, but I appreciate the blessing. But it's so good that you're one of my friends on Facebook. I was wondering, why are the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous eras separated? Were there other mass extinctions that wiped out Jurassic dinosaurs? Thanks for taking the time to go through my question. And by the way, my favorite dinosaur is Allosaurus as well. Good choice, my friend. Allosaurus, anybody that likes Allosaurus is a friend of mine because that's my favorite dinosaur. Okay, why do we separate these three time periods? For a couple of reasons. One, 
Think of time like you would a calendar. Um, you know, you have a year, then you have months, then you have days, and then within days there are hours, minutes, and seconds. So in order to better understand time, we have to have some kind of line that separates different eras, uh, and sometimes that line is based on something dramatic, like the end of the Cretaceous has a dramatic ending. Uh, there was uh, an extinction event that occurred between the Jurassic and the Cretaceous. Uh, it may not have been as massive as other, other better known extinctions like the Permian and the Cretaceous, but there was an extinction period there. So sometimes, yes, that could be the definitive line that separates the two. But other times it could be whether or not the, uh, the different time periods are found together. In other words, to find the Triassic period, you can't go to, um, to South Dakota and here's the Cretaceous and if you go down the hill, there's the Jurassic and then there's the Triassic. It doesn't always work that way. So there aren't real clear lines. What it could be is like, you may go to Germany to find a good Jurassic time period. And I think that's where the Jurassic period got its name from the Jura Mountains. Was it in Germany? I think it was in Germany. Anyway, um, there's different ways of naming the different time periods. And once all paleontologists or the, the leaders come together, they can kind of decide what is the time that breaks that up. And so sometimes it is a definitive mark in the sand. Sometimes it is simply we found a, a, a formation in a different country and here are the ages of that formation. So therefore we're going to decree that is the age of the time period we will now call the Jurassic. I hope that makes sense because I'm more confused as you or than you are and I'm the one that just said it. So that's pretty impressive. All right. <laughs> Felix from Stockholm, Sweden. I have one question about Yiqui. Was Yiqui active at night or during the day? I think that's how you pronounce it, Yiqui. That's that little uh, carnivore that was discovered that had appeared to be a long index finger. And I don't know if it was proven or not, but I know there was a theory or a hypothesis that it had um, uh, a stretch of skin like bat wings versus feathers. Um, and so if it did have those bat-like wings, I guess your question is, did it hunt at night? Well, I, I would probably think not because night hunting requires very specialized equipment. And that would be, I mean, let me take it back. Night hunting requires special equipment if you are gliding through the sky and running through the, you know, flying through the air. If this thing could glide, would it fly around like a bat? I don't think so because I don't think it would have had the advanced eyes to be able to see in the dark necessary to be able to dodge things as it's flying. See, walking in the dark is a whole lot different than flying in the dark. Flying in the dark, you don't have the opportunity to sidestep an oncoming tree as easily as if you were walking or running in the dark. So my guess would be it was probably maybe an early morning hunter or maybe an evening hunter, but I don't necessarily think that would have lived a life like an owl or a bat where it is strictly nocturnal. All right, Luke from Astoria, Oregon. Hello, DG. How's it going? It's going very good, Luke. I hope it's going good for you too. I have two questions. What do you think of Jurassic World and who would win in a fight between an American lion and a saber-toothed tiger? Jurassic World, loved it, loved it. Um, I know a lot of people got very upset because it wasn't scientifically accurate. My opinion is, oh my gosh, it is a fictional movie. <laughs> dinosaurs don't have to be scientifically accurate because we who love dinosaurs demand it. The public wants to be entertained. It doesn't necessarily want to be educated. And in my opinion, if you're going to a movie like Jurassic World to be educated about dinosaurs, then that's probably not the most, that, that's not the venue. That would be like if I wanted to learn about space and I went to go watch Star Wars. It's not, they have nothing to do with each other. So I love the show and I know some people were upset about it, but I think, I think they did a great job in the show of making it clear to everybody, these are not dinosaurs, these are lab created animals. That alone should have stopped most of the complaints, but what can you do? But I loved it. I thought it was very entertaining and I enjoyed it. Your second, uh, second question, who would win, an American lion or a saber-toothed tiger? Well, these animals live together, same time, same places. 
and therefore, since they were able to survive together, then I don't think there would be one advantage over the other. I think these animals living together, if one could kill the other in a fight, well, they would kill them all to eliminate the competition. I don't believe these animals ever interacted much. Uh, if they did, I don't know, saber-toothed cats may have been more likely to be lone hunters. The American lion, if it's like its modern counterpart, would have lived in a family group, and that would have given an advantage. So, I don't know. Can one saber-toothed cat fight a family of American lions? I don't think so. So anyway, my best guess would be maybe the American lion would have an advantage, but I doubt that these animals would probably go at it. All right, finally, Alexander from Stockholm, Sweden. Hello, DG. It's good to see you back and hope you're doing well. I am, Alexander. It's great to be back, and it's good to be talking to you again. Here's my question. I was reading an article about Dimetrodon, which said that the animal was more dog-like and had fur covering many body many parts of its body, including the giant sail. So do you think it's true, or do you believe it was more reptilian-like? Hope this wasn't too much for you. Have a good day. Thank you, Alexander. Have a good day, my friend. Uh, Dimetrodon is an amazing animal. I love him, obviously, since I live in Texas. That's an animal that we find a lot in, in Texas and various places. So is it a furry, hairy-looking animal, or does it have more reptilian skin? Well, it obviously has... Um, features from both groups. Skeletal-wise, it was very mammalian-like, but it still had reptilian qualities, like the legs splayed out to the side and most likely dragging of the tail. Maybe even almost dragging the belly, unless it's up and moving very quickly. So, I don't know if during the Permian that fur covering would have appeared then. I think that comes much later on, maybe in the late Jurassic, early Cretaceous when the little mammalian guys seem to be uh, needing more fur because they're probably nocturnal. And so body temperature would have been an important thing. When you get to Dimetrodon, I don't think heat ever was an issue for them because I believe the Permian is a more dry, arid environment. So I don't think fur would have been a necessity. So I tend to believe that they were not furry because it wasn't a necessity, at least for Dimetrodon, during his, in his environment. Because I think it's just simply too hot to want to be covered in fur. So that's my guess. Now as for the sale, I will say this. I've seen a couple of people who have come up with the idea that there was no sort of interconnecting membrane between the sale. So rather than look like one big continuous sale, it may have looked like a picket fence with nothing in between. Now I don't understand what the benefit of that would be. I believe that there would be a membrane and that it would have been vascular, meaning there would have been blood vessels in it, because I think it would have been an ideal way to shed excess body heat through that big sail. At night, maybe it lost a lot of its body heat. Maybe early in the morning, if it needed it, it would use it like a solar panel. But um, I don't know. I, I, it's a mystery animal. The problem with anything from the Permian is that so far back in time that the uh, evidence is very minimal or limited anyway, and it's hard to guess. All right, everybody, I enjoyed doing this one. I'm gonna do a series today. I'm gonna shoot as many as I can before I run out of time. So if you have a question, go to my website, dinosaurgeorge.com, click on the Ask Dinosaur George button, fill out the form and submit it. I'll do my best to answer it. Until then, I'll see you guys soon.